Welcome to the 243rd episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. Welcome and thank you for listening. Well, the Austin Marathon is now in the books. We're going to do a recap of that and a few other things, but like we always get started, let's see what's growing in the backyard in Florida. I think we're almost in the 80s today. Um, humidity is back. When I was in Austin, they said it was humid up there. It was not. Florida's humid. We have the key to humidity down here. But anyway, it's good for the vegetables. Uh, now that things are getting getting warm, um, tomatoes on the vine and picking some. Eggplants on my tower garden. Collar, collard greens. Um, in the raised bed, kale on the tower garden, Swiss chard in the tower garden, avocado trees and mango trees are blooming. We have pepper plants that are blooming, the Thai chilies, so that's all good. I still have my microgreens going. My favorite are the broccoli, but I got some new varieties of basil to uh, start. The peas are good. And again, you know, outside I put the leftovers from my microgreens in my flower beds and uh, especially where I have some fig trees planted and I, I have this edible landscape now with peas and um, kale growing up there and some of the broccoli so it's pretty cool cilantro's coming out of nowhere so it's great to be able to go out in the in the yard and get uh, fresh herbs so I'm, I'm hoping by doing the basil microgreens and getting those started and then putting them out that I'll have basil scattered scattered all over the place so that's that's really exciting um, I've enjoyed the fennel microgreens as well because, it, again, when I do pizzas or, um, uh, you know, do anything soups that, you, you know, before bean soup that it would have had, a, you know, perhaps a sausage in another life, um, placing the fennel seeds really works well uh, for that. So um, give microgreens a try. Uh, you know, it doesn't take much effort. Just if you have a little window by the sun and a fairly – um, stable environment, not too much breeze and not too much humidity. It, it works out really good. I received a lot of feedback on the last week's podcast cast with uh, um, Nanette and Julie. Uh, people want to meet her, and you can meet her by coming to our fifth annual Charlotte County Plant-Based Nutrition Conference. Uh, it's going to be March 28th all day long at the Port Charlotte Beach Complex. Breakfast and lunch, whole food plant-based, Pam Popper's going to be there, Karen Hartglass, Julie and Nanette, uh, myself and Addie will be talking. We're going to do a format that are, are, are like TED Talks, so each of us are going to do two 18-minute talks. We're going to have a cooking demonstration. Uh, we're going to have question and answer sessions, and it's a nice intimate ses uh, setting so that people will be able to ask questions. You'll be sitting at round tables with other people that are like-minded, so you know if you know, unlike Julie and Nanette, who don't see a stranger when it comes to plant base, you, you know, some people say, oh, you know, I don't have any support. Well, this is a great day to have support and be immersed in people. Learn from your peers uh, that are plant based, learn from other people's struggles, uh, and also be motivated from all the accomplishments that are, that are in the room. It's, it's a really, really nice day and it's a beautiful venue. So I hope you'll join us. There's still spots left for the immersion week if you want to join us the week before. We'll be exercising every morning. Uh, there'll be lectures and cooking classes and Pilates and yogurt. Yoga, not yogurt, but yoga. And um, you'll have consultations with Addie Meinrich and myself in the beginning of the week and the end of the week to go over all your medical conditions and concerns. And we'll set up a plan for you so that when you leave Port Charlotte after the conference, you will be well on your way to becoming healthier than you've ever become. So um, go over to drdelaney.com. This is the time to do it and uh, secure your spot. There will be a price increase in the conference starting March 9th. So get the tickets before the price goes up or the tickets sell out. They are going rather fast. Um, I'm very excited that people aren't waiting to the last minute uh, for the conference. So the tickets are flying out the door. Can't wait uh, to see you all. So it's going to be really, really exciting. I will be speaking at the Port Charlotte or Punta Gorda Veg Fest uh, here in a week, along with Michael Greger. So uh, if you're coming, uh, if you're in the area, you can come up to hear that. You know, these uh, Veg Fest are free talks. There's lots of great people. Dr. Neil Barnard was down, Dr. Clapper, 
And they're nice free events uh, that you can sit out and listen, but you don't really get to ask any questions. Certainly, you know, the food at a veg fest is more of, car you know, it's not carnival food, but it's uh, a little bit less than you would like uh, to have nutrition-wise. Um, certainly, you, you don't get to meet it as many people or be immersed um, in an intimate setting. So it's a good, good way to, you know, to learn about plant-based nutrition and get started. But if you really want to get into it and you really want to develop some good connections, come see us at our conference. So let's talk Texas. You know, Addie Delaney Minerich lives in Houston. Her husband, Nathan, is the, one of the strength coaches for the University of Houston football team. And Houston is a lot like Florida. It's flat and humid. Not quite as humid as here, maybe. Maybe on some days it is. Um, and we were sitting talking with their neighbors, telling them that we had registered for the Austin Marathon. And they's like, so you like hills? He's like, what do you mean? And he's like, yeah, that's hill country. And I did not know that Austin was hilly. But, you know, people that live in flat areas, you know, define a hill. You know, I'm from West Virginia and the mountains. I know hills. Um, you know, so is it, you know, big hills, little hills, you know, and, and I've always been one of these people that, you know, take what people say and kind of divide it out a little bit and don't really think it's going to be quite as hilly as what it might have been. But yes, it's hilly. It was hilly. Um, I believe there was a thousand sixty foot elevation gain over the course of 26.2 miles. It was kind of funny when I was reviewing my Garmin data, the course looks like uh, a cross. You start uh, in town and you go south and then you go east and you go north and west. And the map in the east and west, um, the area is called West Lake Hills. And then the south is called Sunset Valley. So, you know, you have valley and hills. So you can only imagine what was in between. At one point, it, you know, so you go south first and then you go east and then you go north and then west and then back into town. And in the northern part and coming around west, you know, you kind of lose your bearings a little bit where my travel was cloudy that day. So it wasn't like I could really see where the sun was at all times and you kind of lose your perspective. Uh, and I kept thinking, man, when are we going to turn around and see the beautiful buildings of Austin? Um, it's a great skyline. It's like, I got to see those buildings that we're going to run to because if I can't see those buildings, I'm not almost finished. And it took quite a while before you could see those buildings, you know, probably four miles left in the race before you could really start to get some glimpse of the buildings and, you know, around some of the corners and over the hills. Um, so it, uh, took a, took a while. My official time was four hours and 34 minutes. That was ninth in my age group. Um, wasn't the race I wanted, but if you look at all of my 30-some marathons, it was in the top 10 for sure as far as times go. Um, on Saturday when we arrived, we went to Houston on, or I'm sorry, we went to Austin on Friday and found a really great uh, vegan um, restaurant, yoga area uh, in uh, a little south of the city. And Saturday morning, uh, and, and, and so, you know, as far as people talk about traveling and food, and this was kind of a cafeteria style they made. One, um, you know, uh, they, they had, you know, one set of I guess one entree or one menu for breakfast and you just did cafeteria, cafeteria style all you wanted. And they had homemade tortillas and greens. There's just beautiful, fresh Swiss chard and spinach and kale and collards and pinto beans. And they had um, a, a lentil patty with carrots uh, and rice and they had oatmeal bar, so it was really great. So we so we had a great um, meal when we arrived there, and walked walked around and, and toured around the city a little bit. And later that day, we stopped at a, a restaurant called True Food Kitchen. Uh, there's a couple of those around. There's one in Houston. There's one in Austin. And uh, I actually had a. Uh, it was it was called a bowl that was winter immunity. And um, I had not had lion's mane mushrooms before that weren't, you know, in the powdered form. So that was really cool to have that. Um, 
There was farro and quinoa and carrots and broccolini and garbanzo beans, edamame, organic kale, and, and a garlic broth. And it was really, really good. We also had a cauliflower starter that was seasoned with dill, mint. It had some pistachios and dates, um, which was really, really tasty. Uh, Michael had a cauliflower polenta with broccolini, snow peas, edamame, snap peas, zucchini, watermelon, rash, radish, miso, uh, chili threads. I mean, so great, really, really good food. Um, and the next morning we were at the hotel and, you know, they had, we had our fruit because I'm always worried about getting enough fruit when I travel, but there was oranges and apples and grapefruits and bananas. And so we had oatmeal. Um, but I woke up with a, uh, kind of a scratchy throat and a little bit of, you know, congestion. I wasn't quite sure whether it was the hotel. So, uh, you know, I tried to push the fruit, try to push the fluids like you do. I didn't have a fever or anything. I didn't feel bad. So, you know, you ignore those things as much as you can. There's not much you can do about it. Uh, later that evening, we had our pre-race meal, which is almost always Thai food. And I got it extra spicy so that I could kind of ward off everything. And that seemed to clear me up, you know, pretty good. So I thought I was kind of golden on that. And, uh, so we uh, got out ready to start the race on Sunday morning, and there was a delay of 30 minutes as we were standing there in the crowd with 17,000 friends. Um, apparently somebody had went through the barricades, and uh, there was a question of whether they, there had been a, a, a suspicious package left. So we stood there for 30 minutes to make sure the police cleared that, and thankful that they did, and everything was fine. Um, it's kind of fun to stand in the crowds a little bit. You uh, get to meet the people around you. I was actually standing near an Episcopal priest who was trying to set the Guinness Book of World Records running in a full frock. I don't believe he did it, uh, but it was very nice. He was blessing everyone's souls around us. So um, that, that, was, that was a lot of fun. So you get to, you get to meet people. I, I stand by somebody that really almost ran near me when I was running the California International Marathon. We finished a couple minutes apart. So uh, it's amazing the crowds and the people you get to talk to around. Um, but anyway, we started off and after that 30 minute delay and I just didn't have much get up and go. I started with the four hour pace group because that's really where I was trying to, to hit and just couldn't really get the leg speed up. It was very crowded in the corrals. They weren't seated like they were in Houston, so anybody could just kind of jump in and push in wherever they were. So there was a lot of slower people that were up front that, you you know, when it started, you had to kind of go around people. And uh, so I, I got separated from the pace group really quickly. Not that that made a big difference because, again, you know, once I you know, I was having trouble 920, 915. I felt like I was pushing it as opposed to when I did the California International Marathon, when I was doing 907s, 908s. I thought, oh, this feels nice and easy. This feels great. You know, I was all, so there's a big difference in how I felt from the very, you know, get-go. But again, I kind of attribute it to, you know, I've been standing around, just need to get your stride, get, get uh, scattered out. We had talked with people about the course and, uh, you know, went over it, and they knew the first four miles were largely uphill. You kind of go down, then you start back up. Um, but it, uh, it was a pretty good climb, and it continued to climb. Uh, you know, we were, again, told that it was kind of rollers. Well, you know, it was kind of uphill, then down a little bit, then up, and, um, and more up. And it never really leveled out. Um, probably till like mile 18 after you went up a pretty good climb. And there was a couple, you know, uh, right turns that you would start up a hill that it was almost, you know, you had no momentum going into this, you know, pretty steep hill. So it, um, it's, you know, got between my ears a little bit. I have to admit, you know, it's like, oh, uh, you know, I'm already behind. And, you know, I thought, well, maybe this is good. You know, maybe this is good. I'm starting out slower. I'll have a better finish because I, you know, I didn't know that after mile 18, it was going to be a flat spot and then finish hilling. So I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe I'll come around, maybe it'll come around. And there were a few miles that I, you know, I came around a little bit, but I just never really could get loose and get into a good stride. And, um, you know, I was, I was running by myself, you know, you say by yourself, but you know, thousands of people around you, but I wasn't running in a pace group. And, uh, you know, it just kind of gradually started to take its toll. And then, um, 
you know, I, I was running by feel. I, I don't really look at my watch much after, you know, I started looking. When the splits started to go up, I was like, ah, you know, I'm going to do what I can. I looked at the people in front of me, tried to stay up. At one point in the race, the 415 group came behind, came around me, and I thought maybe I can force it a little bit and try to keep up with them. But I really couldn't. I, I just couldn't get my pace picked up. So I, you know, I kind of went down, you know, even further. And there was a point where my pace really dropped off, you know, where I call it my Samantha miles. You know, in the morning when I do my runs, the first mile is a kind of a walk run with Samantha and Gretchen and then Samantha uh, comes back at the house after about a mile and a half and then um, Gretchen and I go out for another three or four and then I do my speed work by myself so I got I got slowed down to Samantha pace there for a little bit a couple miles and um, and it was you know near the end you know that well you know somewhere in those late to late mid to late middle mid to late miles I should say um, when about with about four miles left, I heard somebody yelling in the back. Uh, let's let's keep up. You can finish in four hours and thirty minutes, and that was the four hour and thirty minute pace group that was coming up behind me. I was like, no way am I going to let them pay, pass me, you know? So I I could hear them in the background. I did not turn around to see them. I didn't know how far back they were, but I started to pick up my pace, and I was able to pick up my pace enough for the last four miles to keep that group from passing me. So when I go back and look at all the data, um, one, my heart rate was pretty high for the whole race. Um, that probably has something to do with this cold that kind of came back. Um, and just the day, you know, I don't think I was under hydrated pretty good the day before. So I don't think there was anything I could have done differently. I slept well. But my heart rate was high for the pace I was running. Uh, probably too much in the early beginning. Um, a smarter person might have slowed down even further uh, when you didn't, you know, when I didn't have a good feeling at that first couple of miles, you know, it might have been a good time to back off even further and hold it, you know, hold it. So instead of, you know, trying to force 920, maybe go back to 945 and see if I could, you know, get, get in the groove of things and then speed up as I went. You know, that's easy looking retro, you know, back at the time, I didn't want to slow up anymore. I'm just going for it. I'm trying to get to four hours, you know, so, um, you know, would that have helped me uh, get closer to the four hours? It might have got me to a 415 perhaps or a 420 uh, instead of the 434. Um, still wasn't four hours. So, you know, hey, you might as well push the pace and get some good training out of it, right? Um I always think that when I have the slow down Sammy miles, you know, at the 18 mile mark, so to speak, 1820, that area that, you know, my head gets the best of me. But, you know, in retrospect, when I look at that, um, slowing down right there allowed me to kind of gather myself enough to have a little bit more speed at the end. So there was nothing I could do at that point. When the four hour and 15 minute group passed me, I couldn't I couldn't speed up anymore, no matter how much I wanted. But I was able to speed up when I heard the four hour and 30 minute people coming a little bit later. So, you know, going slow for a little bit gave me enough recovery time. My heart rate came down um, substantially into the 130s is where I do my long, easy runs, you know, but I had been up in the 150s where I do my 10K pace. And, um, you know, the other thing I'll talk about a little bit is lactic threshold. I wear a Garmin watch that kind of calculates your lactic threshold. And it's a calculation. If you were really going to do a lactic threshold, it's taking a finger prick at peak exercise. And when your lactic threshold gets to a certain level, you know, it's so much lactic acid in your blood, then that becomes the threshold when it kind of levels off. But the Garmin will figure it out based on your pace and your heart rate and your time and all that kind of stuff. And so my lactic threshold had actually declined from um, what it was in December after I had that little sinus infection around Houston. So it had actually come down uh, so that that heart rate's about 147. Now, again, it's a calculation. It's not entirely accurate, uh, but it's fairly close. So, you know, if I'm out running a 930 pace, has been feeling pretty easy, 928, 20 pace, not too bad. So, I mean, it's right in that, it's not too far off the mark of what the pace, you know, that 
that pace should be. So pushing my heart rate in the 150s early on was, you know, now I'm, I'm producing a lot of lactic acid. So, you know, translated, looking in hindsight, you can see why I went to the SAMI pace at mile 18 or 19. I just had more lactic acid build up than I could tolerate. My pace slowed down. I was able to clear it. And then I was able to pick up my pace. So had I kept my heart rate down earlier, a little bit more, then I might not have had such a slowdown uh, in, the, in the Sammy slowed down 18, 19 miles. But, and not to say anything bad about Sammy because uh, she's a really good girl dog. Uh, and uh, my best girl friend dog. So she's sitting right here. So, you know, Sammy's my pal. So it's nothing, nothing bad about Sammy Miles. It's just how we run. But anyway, um, so you, you, you kind of look back hindsight, you know, should I have done something, you know, different at that point? I, I wasn't really looking at my heart rate in the beginning. And again, it would have been, you know, I could have done all those justifications. You know, you're starting out, you're going up a hill, your heart rate's higher, you've got to suck it up. And even in CIM, I was able to tolerate a bit of a higher heart rate than what was predicted. But, um, you know, I also think that it wasn't, um, my head didn't get the best of me causing to me slow down. I, I think there was a lactic acid component that, that really did slow me down. So, what did I learn from all that? And what would I do differently? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, you know, if, again, if I looked at my races, this was somewhat of a, this wasn't as good a race for me as California International Marathon. It was a harder course. Um, but I was hoping that my fitness had improved enough that I would, you know, could be, maintain that pace. I you know, was hoping that my sinus infection, of, you know, a month ago or three weeks ago didn't, you know, cause me as much grief as what I probably knew it did. But, you know, if you never go for it, you, you, you don't really know. So I, I guess I don't have any regrets. Like I said, as for a bad marathon, it was one of my better ones. So it was a good, it was a good miss, so to speak. If you looked at my age group, um, I was, you know, about probably a little over halfway, I was still in about fifth place. Um, so had I slowed down, you know, I'd have moved up in places a little bit, uh, perhaps if I'd have, you know, been able to hold on to things. But again, you know, we weren't going for that. I was really wanting to go for four hours. So I think it was good to, if you're going to race, you know, go ahead and race. If you're going to go for, you know, a time period. So if you don't put it on the line, you never know what you're going to get. So um, I, I think I, I gave it my all for that day. And I, I have a quads to, to, to back that up. I'm, uh, this is, I'm recording this on Wednesday and I, I'm still have some pretty good quad soreness. Um, every bit as much as I had in California, maybe a little bit more. So, you know, I, I don't think I could have pushed it much, much, much more. Um, and then, of course, then the head cold got much worse, you know, the day after the race uh, and into that evening. So, you know, it was coming on. I still didn't have a fever. Uh, I was still in no danger. Um, the other thing fun that the Garmin does is it looks at your body battery. And again, it takes your sleep and your heart rate and your respirations and, into account. It come up, comes up with this... Um, this body battery and usually when you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning your body battery is someplace between 75 and 100 and as the day goes you burn up your body battery and it'll go down to you know five or six or whatever well the day after the race my uh, body battery only went up to five <laughs> and then the next day it only went up to 13 and today it only went up to 51 so i'm getting better but you know i i did um you know, by everything that I can look at, my heart rate, my respirations, my soreness, I, I, I pretty much, um, I, I think I left most of it out there. So I don't have any regrets of dogging it or, you know, mentally collapsing, causing my slower time. I think it was just, just one of those days, you know, they, they can't all be the best days. Um, but there was a story and that's, and that's the most important part. Um, again, a lot of hills and, um, but Austin, you know, is a, is a great town. Uh, I really enjoyed it. People were nice. We went to Lance Armstrong's bike shop. He wasn't there. He also didn't do the race. I don't know why. Um, but uh, we got to see where his bike shop was and see some of the different sites. And again, we had fabulous food, uh, fabulous vegan food. And the funny thing, um, we found this food truck 
and uh, ATX food truck. And we didn't even realize what ATX stood for early on, which is Austin, Texas. Um, and we didn't make that connection. So we kind of had a little bit of laugh afterwards, but we had great um, uh, tempeh and quinoa and greens after the marathon uh, at the vegan food truck. So it was great. So five stars to vegan food in Austin. Um, as well as Houston, but, you know, we were racing in Austin, so that was really, really good. Would I go back and try to redeem myself at that race again? Maybe someday. Um, there's a lot of races that will probably take precedent. Uh, we want to do the full Houston Marathon next year, so and maybe the Caltown Marathon in Texas, but there's a lot of races. We met some people that have a uh, trail running company, so, yeah, you know, to do some of the trail races there. So, there's you know, the bottom line is there's so many places to run, uh, there's so many great marathons out there. I've always made doing marathons a way of vacationing and seeing the sights. And there is no better way to see a city than running 26 miles through it. So I've encouraged anybody to, you know, use marathoning as a, a way to see a city and, and vacation. And that's how I started out. You know, I just signed up for a marathon and um, it made me travel to that particular city. And it was, a, again, a great way. You, you go places during a marathon that you never would in a car or a taxi uh, and see sites and meet people and local people and local restaurants. So it's, it's a great, great way to travel and, and uh, keep fit. So I'll spend the rest of this week recovering. I think I have a cycle ride, you know, or a slow bike ride um, spin later in the week. And then I'll start running again on the weekend and start the build up for Asheville. And that's um, right before the conference, uh, March 21st and 22nd, I believe, whatever that weekend is. We'll do the half marathon on Saturday and the whole marathon on Sunday. And I'm really excited about that because I thought Asheville was hilly until Austin. And so now Asheville is really doable. Uh, there's some big hills in the beginning and some big hills on the backside of the marathon, but there's a lot of flat too. So really flat. So I'm really excited to do the half and the whole there. The big challenge is how hard do you run the half? And so you can run the whole good. But again, you know, we're not going, you know, as my dad said, we didn't used to say we didn't come here to lay up, you know. So if you're going to play a new golf course, you go for it and, um, you know, you give it your best shot. There's always a good story if you give, you give things your best shots. I think in my training, you know, I, I, I want to do more tempo runs, more harder runs. But again, my coach will be dictating those runs to me. He wants me to run more by feel so I can, I can dial that in more. It's still, you know, the more I race, the better I'll understand the feel of things so I can adjust better. Um, so I think I have to keep pushing it until I uh, get, that, get that down, push it in, in, you know, my hard days training need to be hard and my easy days need to be easier. Um, that's what I tell my people as well. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to go out and do a hard workout, it should be a hard workout, but an easy workout should be an easy workout. Most of us, I know myself, I like that gray zone where it's not too hard, not too easy, um, that kind of a pace, but it really doesn't get us the training, uh, what we need. And you kind of get stuck in a, you know, stuck in a pace zone that's again, not too fast, not too slow. So, um, you, you got to push both ends of things to, to improve. Um, I was lax on my strength training. You know, I've been doing my planks. I've been doing a little strength training, but not near enough. So I think for the hills of Asheville and to get and to push myself further, I, I'm going to have to get my hamstrings and my glute and my back a, a little stronger. I guess the other question comes, you know, what's with the sinus infection and the cold coming back? You know, I don't get sick. I'm a vegan. I'm plant-based. You know, I, I shouldn't be ill. I should be immune to all this stuff. Um, you know, I think the bugs are getting bigger, you know, and even us plant strong people can't dodge all of them, you know, add that into, yeah, I took a few days off. The, the last infection I had in Houston, I had a fever for three or four days. And I think that wipes you out more than, you know, than, than you, than you think you come back from it. But, you know, I kind of went back and did training. I missed a long run. Um, but, you know, uh, why do you get, you know, why do plant-based people get sick? My immune, I'm supposed to be, you know, so immunocompromised, or not immunocompromised, but so immunocompetent. Um, you know, I ate tons of fruit, I ate tons of vegetables, you know, but, you know, it happens. I also work long hours and, you know, push my training so your immune system is struggling a little bit. Should I listen to my body a little bit more? Yes, perhaps I should. You know, we, you're flying, you get exposed. 
Um, so, you know, I, I think that I bounce back quicker than I would if I was eating the standard American diet, but it doesn't make me completely immune to, you know, um, having repeated exposures to people with upper respiratory tract infections and viruses. I kept telling myself and all the people that I was exposed to in my office that, you know, hey, you know, same virus I already had, but, you know, you just, you just don't know. So was I completely over the other one? And, and then this one just kind of relapsed, or is this was a new virus? You know, certainly didn't have a fever this time, but um, it does play, you know, play with you a little bit. I, you know, I thought I, I really need to up my fruit intake, you know, when I'm traveling. The day when I'm, you know, we, we took apples and, you know, uh, oranges on the plane, had blueberries in the oatmeal, but, you know, travel day is pretty tough with fruit, um, you know, to, to really get good fruit, fresh fruit. Um, when we got to the hotel, certainly had grapefruit, oranges, bananas, some more blueberries, strawberries. Um, still probably not quite as much as I normally eat. You know, you're out, you're moving around. Again, you have such a high exposure to other people. You know, had lots of greens. Um, uh, you know, I mean, everything that I eat is, you know, just really um, kind of race specific to, to eat, you know, not, you know, not, you know, not, nothing fast foods, always, you know, it's all whole foods. So, you know, it just happens and you have to, you have to deal with the infections as they come. Um, you know, I'll, I'll going to rest and take it easy. And again, more fruit, more fruit, more fruit and build up my immunity. And, and we go again, you know, uh, it, it, it'll all it'll all work itself out and you know can't live in a bubble so you take your chances and then you deal with the consequences and go on but I think that you know I think my being a vegan doesn't make you bulletproof um, but you might be able to take a bull a little bit better so you know can I improve on my fruit a little bit during travel and I'm gonna try but you know it is what it is and you, you, eat, you eat the best that you can uh, in your circumstances and try to wash your hands but you know the exposure is really high Last thing I wanted to do was change gears and talk about a study um, about too much sitting in heart disease. Uh, there was a study published in American Heart Association uh, Journal. Um, the author was from Ameri uh, Arizona State, Dorothy Sears, and she looked at postmenopausal women. And um, the average age were 63 years of age. There were 518 women, and they were Hispanics and non-Hispanics. They all were overweight with a BMI of 31, meaning that they met the, the body mass index to be obese. Those people in the top um, that had a, the most sitting, um, eight and a half hours, you know, um, that was like the kind of cutoff to be in the high. If you had um, eight and a half, the uh, Hispanics sat on average eight and a half hours, the, the non-Hispanics nine hours. Each additional hour that people sat increased their fasting insulin levels of 6%, increased their insulin resistance risk to 7%. Each additional 15 minutes that they sat without getting up increased their insulin level 7%, increased their insulin resistance 9%. So what that translates out to is that, again, if you're not moving, you're not burning your glucose um, you know, they're taking in as, you know, a similar amount of calories, but, you know, being sedentary is going to, you know, it decreases your muscle mass, your mitochondria, your ability to process glucose. And even if you can just get up every 15 minutes, you can do yourself a, a favor. Uh, if you have a job that requires you to sit, you know, nobody's, you know, get up and move around walk around the table, do a couple squats. Uh, that's, that's going to help anything you can. You know, I tell my patients that there's no reason why you can't get a minimum of 7,000 steps a day, 10,000 is even better. At the hotel, I, I calculated that I did 100 steps making my bed. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it was 200 steps making the bed, just going around the bed, you know, making, making the bed. And, you know, so doing those things, you know, make sure, don't, don't cheat, you know, go back and forth around the bed to make your bed. If you go out in the morning, a thousand steps, come back in before lunch, go out a thousand steps in the evening, a thousand steps, you know, walk around between TV shows, you know, all those things can decrease your sitting, increase your steps, increase your metabolism and help your metabolic levels. It's the high insulin levels that people have that cause the inflammation in the body. 
So again, they get more inflammation, you get more pain in your joints. Insulin also leads to high insulin growth factors, stimulate tumor cell growth. So people that have high insulin levels have increased risk for cancers. So increased cancer, increased um, inflammation, decreased, you know, you're, you're hungry more because you don't generate hormones that decrease your hunger. Your, your platelets are, tend to be um, more activated, more likely to clot when you're sitting. People that are overweight, especially in the obese category that their legs swell, they have less venous return, more inclined to blood clots. So it's really important uh, for people to get up and move, especially if they're overweight because of the risk of blood clots. So don't take that lightly at all. You know, continue to move it. Anything, anytime you can, you're, you're generating, um, you know, you're using more energy. You're using your muscle mass. And they actually found that, you know, people that are overweight have more muscle mass because they actually have to lift that weight. So the more you move, the more you're actually going to, you're going to burn. The other hint is to keep your mouth shut when you're, when you're moving, because if you keep your mouth shut and you're breathing through your nose, you're going to deliver more oxygen to your tissues. That increased oxygen is going to allow you to burn more fat instead of just burning the glucose off that you're taking in. So you want to burn those fat stores too. So get up, move around, keep your mouth shut, breathe from your diaphragm, fill your lungs from the bottom up, uh, and things will be much better. And the other study that I'd like to talk about was one in the Journal of American, Cardi Journal of American College of Cardiology, uh, where they looked at changes in the gut microbes and the metabolites. So depending on what you eat, um, you, it, it's kind of the bacteria that you grow in your gut. So if you're eating dead, decaying meat, you grow bacteria that can handle dead, decaying meat. If you're eating high fiber plant food, then you'll develop um, bacteria more along the species that like high fiber. And it turns out that when you eat meat or you eat eggs, when those are broken down, uh, they mix with your gut, back, uh, gut microbes and you generate a metabolite called trimethylamine and ox oxide, which is labeled TMAO. And TMAO increases um, inflammation in the arterial wall and is associated with coronary artery disease, coronary risk, and, event, and coronary um, events such as heart attacks. On the other hand, if you're eating high fiber diet, you generate short chain fatty acids. So they looked at people over a 10 year period and the people that were in the um, highest range for uh, the, the, the highest change in their gut microbes. So they look 760 people. And the people that had the, the highest um, TMAO levels had the most coronary artery disease. So between when they started in 1989, 1990 to 2000 and 2002, the people that had the largest change in TMAO levels had the incre most increased risk for coronary artery disease. So it's very important, you know, your, your nutrition over the long run. When you think, again, like I talked about the last podcast, these people that are eating a carnivore diet or high fat, high meat diet, they're generating all this, these TMAO levels that are causing all this inflammation in the, in the coronary arteries. That just does not go away. It, it tends to accumulate. You have to have the short chain fatty acids to make, you know, the good chemicals, uh, good chemicals in your brain. Uh, to be able to metabolize glucose and cholesterol uh, appropriately to generate energy, you know, so it's a much more efficient system when you're feeding your gut high fiber diet. So it's not just about the meal, it's about the long term effects you have when you're throwing, you know, this bad food. And, you know, when people say, oh, I have a steak once a month or once in a while, well, you're, again, you're switching, you're changing, you're selecting for these bad bacteria that are, that are going to make these chemicals that are harmful over the long term. So it's not like, you know, it's just a one and done and it doesn't count. It does count. So every, every meal does count. So uh, choose things wisely that's going to help you, help you perform the best, help you think the best, help you in your long-term health. And if you can just have that 90-second pause, you know, before you make that decision, do I really want this? Is it really going to help me? Is it going to help me, you know, to accomplish what I want to, what I want to accomplish both nutritionally and, and, you know, through your activity in your daily, in your daily life to be able to do what you want to do. So, um, that's where eggs sneak in and cause the, again, these TMAO levels to rise, you know, and if they're hidden in pastries, again, the TMAO levels are going to rise. So, you know, eat your fruits and vegetables, high fiber, 
do the best you can because we know even if you do the best you can, you're still susceptible to some of these things. So you, you have to have you have to put on a good fight. You have to have good defenses. So remember, life is a lot like a marathon, and you've got to train for it. So if you want to train with us and you want to hear some great talks, again, uh, come down and join us for our immersion week, March 22nd through the 28th. Come down for the conference on the 28th. Get your tickets soon. Make your hotel reservation soon because this is season in Florida. Everybody wants to be here. We have beautiful weather right now, low humidity, 80 degrees, sunshine, blue skies. So come down and join us at a beautiful venue right on the water. Plant-based breakfast and lunch, speakers, great friends, great connections, great activities. See you soon. Go to the website, drdelaney.com. Get your tickets. Call us. Email us if you have any uh, further questions. Jamie at drdelaney.com. Email, uh, and it's the, the web address is dr, D-O-C-T-O-R, D-U-L-A-N-E-Y, spelled out, dot, dot com. Make sure you get the tickets quickly because, again, there will be a price increase for the last few tickets. So get on the board, get on the horn, get it done, and look forward to seeing you. Thanks for listening. Thank you.